Um, let me reiterate what I, what I ended with last time, which is that I just think it would be so worth people's while if they made sure to read De Docta before the 550th anniversary of Cusa's death, which is August 11th. So it's coming up. But you've got plenty of, plenty of time. So just, um, I think that would be really fantastic. And uh, um, how many people here saw Will Wirtz's Wednesday night class on Kuzo? Or was it a Sunday? Sunday. It was Sunday, yeah. Who saw that? A number of people saw it? I would really recommend that. I mean, let me reiterate what I probably said at the beginning of last class, which is that you've got Helga's fantastic articles, you've got Will's excellent work, really incredible work that he did largely while he was in prison, and then you've got uh, a, a whole other mess of different articles that are very useful. Um, so uh, those things are all really accessible, and I hope that people just get prompted you know, to pick up one or two of these things over the next couple of weeks. So. I'm, I think it's really difficult. I'm trying to figure out how to, how could you teach De Docta Ignorantia? How could you spend, an, you know, 90 minutes or two hours on the, the seminal work of, of the Renaissance? So, I mean, it's a big, it's a big challenge. So, I mean, over, over the next few, uh, over the next few courses or classes, I guess I'm going to, I'm going to, try to take up different of Kuz's works, but this is intended to be a kind of an introduction to De Docta and what was the profound effect that it, that it had. Um, and this is just through, you know, one or two, one, one aspect or another. It's not at all comprehensive. But I, when I was looking through Linden's work from the 90s, I came across a speech that was recorded in 1993 and was the <laughs> keynote of a Schiller Institute conference. So it was recorded from Lynn's jail cell. And <coughs> it's called something like um, The Importance of the Spirit of the Renaissance. Um, and this is a quote from it. And this is how I would like you to think about what we're trying to accomplish today. Okay, so Lynn says, this is like the last two paragraphs. I find this speech to be really fascinating. It's a somewhat different mode from what I'm used to from Lynn. There's, there's a poignancy to it. We must see ourselves as individuals, as potentially the embodiments of reason, as imago dei, we must look into the faces of people around the world and see not different races or this or that distinction, but see in those faces, in those eyes, another human being who is also Imago Dei, who has that potential within them, and seek to raise that potential within them or to create the circumstances in which the ideas of doing good are presented more clearly to the individual and in which the opportunities for doing that good are more freely provided. If we do that, we are participating in creation. We are of value to mankind as individuals, beyond all doubt. So again, in this best, po best of all possible worlds, as Leibniz described it, let evil prompt us, not merely to deny evil, which we must do, we must denounce it, as well as denying it, but let us be prompted by evil, as Schiller described the principle of tragedy. The tragedy of evil must be attacked, recognized, feared, and hated to such a degree that we are willing to do good, finally to supplant the evil. So I think that this has some... Please turn your, your cell phone's <laughs> ringers off. 
I think this has something to do with Lynn's... I mean, what he's calling on you to do in the end there, to recognize the tragedy of evil, I think that we have a lot of work to do on this. If you ask, why is Lynn always hammering at the satanic British Empire? Why is he saying that Bertrand Russell is a Satan? Why does he say Satan this, Satan that, Satan the other? It's because people don't get the principle of evil, or the, or the principle of tragedy of evil, or however you want to think about this. And I think it's very difficult to do these things, because um, you think about 1900, you think about Bertrand Russell, and it's so deeply ingrained in you, in the way, like, and most, I think, most uh, sort of subtly in social relations. And it's, so you get used to a certain way of thinking, you get used to a certain identity, and to ask you to recognize the evil that you're living with and the evil of the system that you live within is very difficult. And I bet you everyone in this organization can remember, like, an epiphany that they had where all of a sudden they realized something about society some, that was principally wrong. That there was something that was about the whole thing that was off. That there, was a, there was something that, that meant that this, we were tending towards annihilation. That, that, that society is not in accordance with natural law, right? And I think that's, that's absolutely essential if you're going to get the top part, which is... You, which is how the society we have to create. So y you got to know what's wrong. You have to have that epiphany about what's satanic as part of the process of being able to treat people as the Imago Dei. You know, like we think about, think about what, <laughs> what Tony Chaikin raised on the, on the Thursday night class. How many people were sort of, more, not, I don't know exactly the word I'm looking for, but imagine the feeling that you felt when he went through the fact that in sub-Saharan Africa, only 5% of the people in rural areas have electricity. And that kind of, all of a sudden, reminder of the rest of humanity that maybe you, wasn't, maybe you weren't thinking about for a while. Maybe it wasn't at the front of your mind. Um... Okay, so the reason I start with this is because De Docta, I think, is a significantly challenging work. It's complete, Kuza speaks in a completely different language from what we're used to. Kuza thinks in a completely different way from what we're used to. And um, he's constantly making references to things that you wouldn't necessarily pick up on because you're not, you know, a Roman Catholic, uh, 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 you know, priest. <laughs> Or, or, or whatever it may be, that you just simply, it's difficult. Um, and it's also very beautiful. And everyone who has taken the time to put themselves aside and read Kuza can know that kind of experience where you have to drop your old, your, this is sort of a lesser way of thinking, you have to start, you get, and you get into his way of thinking and thinking through the paradoxes of things and thinking through the limits of concepts. <laughs> And it really, it's a different way of being. So what is that? And what is it that he did that was so revolutionary? Um, I think if you want to understand that, you have to understand what was the satanic system that he was living in. Because, as I went through in the last class, I mean, this is the... This is the period where the, the church is responsible for burning uh, Joan of Arc alive. And I don't mean like the church as a whole, but you know, but yeah, it is the church as a whole. It's, you know, kind of both at the same time. So, I really like this. When I, when I, when Alexandra and I were working on Brunelleschi a little bit together, I thought that this was a really tremendous illustration and story. I don't know if she used these. Yeah, she, yeah. She did? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's worth returning to it as a way of conceptualizing what I'm talking about in terms of that leap of thinking that you have to take on. That, that, that Lynn is talking about here. This is what he's talking about. 
and seeing other people as Imago Dei is the kind of leap that Brunelleschi achieved here. On the left is Brunelleschi's, and on the right is Donatello's. This might be actually worth turning off the lights for, to be able to see it a little bit more clearly, because I think it's, it's a very good historical expression of the thinking of the Renaissance. I mean, the one on the left looks like a painting. It's, you know, I mean, it's, the, the, it's, the details are so subtle. And you can notice, I mean, I have a p close-up of the uh, faces here. It becomes more obvious. But Donatello, I mean, it's not that Donatello's isn't beautiful. I think it's very beautiful. I think it's very, you know, I think it's, it's very evocative. <coughs> but there's something of a different quality in Brunelleschi's. And it is a human quality, and at the same time it is a godly quality. There's something that's more vulnerable about Brunelleschi, the way, even though it's the way that he... I mean, think about what, what's actually going on. If you look at the crucifix a lot and you don't really think about it, you may fail to conceive of what's happening. And, and the, the, the Romans did this to many, 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 many people. Your first thing, you know, your, first you're, you're, you're scourged. It means, it means you're, you're, you're hit with the whip, with a nine-tipped whip or whatever it may be. And so his whole back is all ripped up. And, this, you know, and, then, and then he gets the crown of thorns, which causes you to bleed a bunch because the scalp is going to bleed a lot. And then, and then you're actually suspended. All of your weight is on the three nails. So he's holding himself up on that nail at the bottom or with his arms. You know, and there's various theories about how people died from crucifixion, that it, maybe it was actually asphyxiation, that maybe you actually you, you, were, you, you found it impossible to breathe before you died of other means. There's all these different things that, anyway, it's very gruesome. But, but just consider that the, clearly the figure on the left, to me, to my mind, is, is more vulnerable in his position, in his lifelike qualities. Yes. What, say that again, Linda. Yeah. Yeah. He has. I think you're right. Yeah. He's. That. I think that's. You know. So that's the divine quality, is that he has overcome it. Anyway, so I, it would be pointless to try to put this in the words anymore. But just keep this in mind, as because remember the story is Donatello has created this beautiful object, a beautiful object of art on the right, and then Brunelleschi comes in and he says, "How could you? How could you put a pe You know, a peasant worker on the cross. This is not. This isn't. This doesn't hold up to the level of what we're talking about. What he's talking. But what he's talking about is." Is it godly? Is it divine? And that's the question that we're dealing with when we're talking about Kuza. Is man as a man God? Man as a creative, sharing in the creativity of, of God. So, let me just leave it at that. Um, all right. The world that Kuza lives in is dominated, as I went through last class, by up until, up until, you know, the 1420s when the humanists really start working on this. And even then, it's dominated by Aristotle. And I think that a lot of people, you know, I've talked to a few people about it, and it's funny. The things that we've published are very clear, and I think people should investigate it if they're not so clear on this, but I've had, heard Again, this point on, on Satan, I think it's the stupidest thing in the world. Not the stupid, how do I put it? It's a great responsibility of ours to make sure that people don't just think that the oligarchy's agents are like misguided or, you know, or somehow like 
Well, he tried. He tried and he, and, you know, he failed. He came up with this really stupid doctrine. That's never the case. You know, that's never the case in the important questions. And people should realize that Aristotle was deployed by the oligarchy. And there's a whole, I, I imagine the older members don't, are, are much more familiar with this stuff because of a lot of Plato readings and so forth that we did. Susan Kokinda has written a number of really excellent articles about this that make, make it very clear what's going on. But uh, if you think about, um, just very briefly, okay, the Platonic Dialogues, it escapes me right now exactly what years they go through, but I think it ends up, it ends up around, I mean, Socrates' death is right around 400 BC, right? And they go, uh, maybe they go 50 years before that, 60 years, something like that. Because it covers the whole arc, because, yeah, because in the Parmenides, Socrates is a young scholar. He's a young, he's young, and he's seeing, and he meets Parmenides, and he meets, and this is the first chronologically. And then, and he meets, uh, I think Zeno is there, I, I forget exactly, but anyway. And the, the, what Susan Kokinda does is she goes through this beautiful arc, read, read the article, she goes through this, this interest, uh, incredible arc where, where, first of all, the Parmen Parmenides is an Eleatic. And he's, he comes in, and because the, because the Persians can't defeat, uh, cannot, cannot defeat the Athenians militarily, because the Athenians have, have st scored incredible victories in this period. They've scored, you know, the, the battle at Marathon, uh, and, uh, and um, I have this written in my outline, but I, I should have printed out. Anyway, they've scored incredible victories, but they can't, just like in the situation here in the United States, they know they can't win at this point militarily, so they have to poison Athens from the inside. So they introduce the Eleatics. The Eleatics are the ones that say, well, God is unknowable. God is, 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 the infinite is something you can never have any knowledge of. So, man, man's mind is not compatible with truth whatsoever. And the, that allows the introduction of the sophists who say, you have your truth, I have my truth. You know, truth is just relative. But first you have to destroy the, you have to poison and corrupt the idea of the, uh, you know, of the one true God, of the platonic God and truth. So, Aristotle is deployed after Plato has made this valiant effort to resist the evil corruption that comes from the oligarchy through the, through the sophists in particular, right? And Aristotle, you know, famously, he's pointing down, whereas Plato is pointing up. He, he's also the assassin of Alexander in case anyone forgot. So, but he comes in to the Platonic Academy and he, start, he, he just is a wrecking ball and he's putting out, out all of this completely fraudulent, insane stuff that then the oligarchy establishes as the base of knowledge for 1700 years with exceptions. So let me just go through some, I'll return to this. Let me go through some, uh, some stuff on the material on this. In 1449, Cusa writes Apology for De Docta Ignorantia, which people know is a defense of De Docta, against an attack on De Docta that was issued by a guy named Wenk in 1444 from Heidelberg, from the University of Heidelberg. And the funny thing is that Wenk in his, in his thing, he writes, Cusa has no respect for Aristotle. He's completely, he's completely disregarded the philosopher. And Cusa writes a response five years later, he says, and which basically says, yeah, exactly, that's the point. Nowadays, the Aristotelian tendency dominates, says Cusa, which finds the coincidence of opposites which one has to acknowledge to find the ascent toward mystical theology to be a heresy. To those trained in this school, 
This approach seems to be totally nonsensical. They refuse it as something completely opposite to their intentions. Therefore, it would be close to a miracle, as well it would be a complete transformation of the school, if they were to abandon Aristotle and reach a higher level. So Aristotle is so poisonous that it would take a miracle for you to break free of him. Um, the key in the whole the key in the whole discussion is going to be this question of the coincidence of opposites. Because again, what I'm saying is that so Aristotle denies the coincidence of opposites. And we'll go through various things, but they're all related to this. And that denial of the coincidence of opposites, with very few exceptions, lasts for 1700 years. So just think that think about that. We'll go through what it means very relatively extensively. Okay, so this is from a book that is aptly named Posterior <laughs> Analysis. <laughs> so, in other words, the study of a rear end. And uh, we have, and it's, and Aristotle says here, he lays out his vision of knowledge. Because that's really, anyway, I'll get into it. Aristotle says, we have already said that scientific knowledge through demonstration is impossible unless a man know the primary immediate premises. How does man know? That's the big question. We must possess a capacity of some sort which is at least an obvious characteristic of all animals, for they possess a congenital discriminative capacity which is called sense perception. So, our sense perception comes to be what we call memory, and out of frequently repeated memories of the same things develops experience. For a number of memories constitute a single experience. From experience, again, originates the skill of the craftsman and the knowledge of the man of science. Right. All very simple. Yeah. <laughs> this reminds me... Trading. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> this reminds me of what... Lynn talks about in uh, So You Wish, which uh, Jason went, went through more than once about um, the laws of thermodynamics. That these, are, that these are laws of the legislative variety, not of the scientific variety. So these are, these are, in, these are you know, these aren't, this, Aristotle is laying out what's going to be acceptable. Here's the rules, get used to it. Later he says in his work De Anima, which is on soul, since according to common agreement, there is nothing outside and separate in existence from sensible spatial magnitudes, the objects of thought, thought are all in sensible <laughs> forms, both abstract object, objects and all the states and affections of sensible things. Hence, no one can learn or understand anything in the absence of senses. And when the mind is actively aware of anything, it is necessarily aware of it along with an image, for images are like sensuous contents. While in respect of all the other senses, <laughs> we fall below many species of animals, in respect to touch, we far excel all other species in exactness of discrimination. That is why man is the most intelligent of animals. <laughs> so talk about per a perverted, yeah, ideology, yeah. Yeah, ooh, yeah, no, that's, that's right, this is... Yikes. So... I would just ask you to reflect on this again. This is the power of the oligarchy. That they got this to stand for so many damn centuries. Who, the he who on earth would, would accept this? This is the stupidest thing you could possibly imagine. I mean, it's just terrible. But it was forced on people. You know, they killed Socrates, right? It's just worth thinking these things through, because Kuza is in such a battle. And if you're not reading De Doctor from that standpoint, then you're going to miss it. Okay. 
when we ask the question of how does man know, everyone knows this, this from Kuza, and it's worth going through. This is from book one of De Docta. It is not the case that by means of likenesses, a finite intellect can precisely attain the truth about things. Because the truth is infinite. So how could a finite intellect precisely attain unto the infinite? For truth is not something more or something less, but is something indivisible. Whatever is not truth cannot measure truth precisely. By comparison, a non-circle cannot measure a circle whose being is something indivisible. Hence, the intellect, which is not truth, never comprehends truth so precisely that truth cannot be comprehended infinitely more precisely. For the intellect is to truth as an inscribed polygon is to the inscribing circle. The more angles the inscribed polygon has, the more similar it is to the circle. However, even if the number of its angles is increased ad infinitum, the polygon never becomes equal to the circle unless it is resolved into the identity, into an identity with the circle. Hence, regarding truth, it is evident that we do not know anything other than the following, namely, that we know truth not to be precisely comprehensible as it is. For truth may be likened unto the most absolute necessity, which cannot be either something more or something less than it is, and our intellect may be likened unto possibility. Therefore, the quiddity of things, quiddity means like the itness, the thingness of things, which is the truth of all beings, the truth of beings, is unattainable in its purity. Though it is sought by all philosophers, it is found by no one as it is. And the more deeply we are instructed in this ignorance, the closer we approach the truth. Does that generally follow for people? Any questions on this? In book four of the Harmonies, which we went through this week for Kepler, we, Kepler talks about water, and he goes through all of the emanations of water. And he talks about how you can see how water feels, and how it tastes, and how it smells, and, you know, and how, it, how it responds to different things, how it, how it sounds. Um, but none of those sense perceptions are with the water itself. They're just, you never get to the quiddity of things. You can only deal with the shadows, right? So, just to like develop a little bit further, this is what we're talking about. This is what we're dealing with. How does man know anything? What does it mean to measure something? That was kind of like a aha moment for me. Because I think this is one of those kinds of things where if you're in the dark age, you really don't know what you, the words mean that you're using. <clears throat> I never really thought about what it meant to measure something. I thought it meant you use a ruler. You know? But when you measure something, you're comparing it to something else, right? Kuza, in his, in his uh, dialogue on the, the layman on mind, he has the layman, who's like his Socrates character, say, I think that the word measure comes from the Latin word mens, for mind. Because that's what you're doing. And this is what Lin is obsessed with right now, is how do you measure man? How do you measure the universe? So, keep that in mind. Um, but the point that Kuza makes that's very powerful is, if measuring is comparing something to something else, and yet, in the created world, nothing can be exactly the same, there's no two objects that, are, that couldn't be more similar ad infinitum. If you have two, if we had two glasses, 
and you zoomed in and you, and you said, no, these are perfectly the same. They're perfectly, absolutely the same. But are those the same at the level of 10 microns? Or, you know, of like, are they the same when you get to the very tiniest microcosm? Of course, they can't be. They absolutely can't be because they're two different things. And within the created universe, there's no, there's, there's, there's no such thing as equality. Everything is unequal. So, that gets you to start thinking about what does it even mean to measure? If, if I, because I, I thought that measuring was me putting down the ruler or whatever and comparing it to the other thing that I wanted to, to use. But in fact, Kuza is making it clear that that's not what you're doing. You're somehow, you're measuring the finite to the infinite. You're measuring, you're, you're using, you're measuring what you find in the created universe to what you know of the divine within your own mind. You can say that <clears throat> if you have two objects, uh, there's something else, which is their relation. And the relation is a, is a object of mind. It's not a thing, mm -hmm. but it's something other than the two things. Kepler develops this early on yeah. in terms of intervals in music. Mm -hmm. But the interval is, is an aspect of mind. It's not a thing. It's, it's, you know, it's very similar. I mean, throughout the other thing, that, of course, the doctor is all about is the Trinity. And he uses the, the concept of the Trinity to deal with everything. And he, makes, and he makes exactly that point, that whenever he's constantly using the... the uh, well, let me back away from that for now, but we'll return to it. I think that's a good, that's a good point. Yeah. How could you have two lines which are perfectly parallel? would be sort of like that, sort of yeah. what Gauss later uh, developed, right? Attacking the uh, Euclidean geometry. Mm -hmm. sort of follows from what he's saying. Absolutely. I mean, what you're dealing with in Kusa, in Didacta, is a ex explication of the hierarchy of the universe. And when you're... of um, uh, uh, how do you get, what are the, I mean, he, he's making discoveries about, for example, with, the, with this very example here, the circle and the inscribed polygon. It's not just that the circle and the polygon are different types of shapes or different species, which they are. It's that the circle is a higher species, which is a discovery that Kuza makes that is completely new to mankind. Lin writes a very explicit appendix on this to his, I think it's um, on the subject of God. It may be on, on temporal et, um, eternity. Anyway, one of, these, one of those pa papers from the early 90s. Uh, prior to Kuza, you had Archimedes, who had attempted the quadrature of the circle. Does everyone know what that means? Where you're trying to identify the area of a circle, and since you can't do that with the circle, you have to use a, the quadrature, you have to use uh, you know, a polygonal system uh, to figure it out. Archimedes has a system where he comes up with an answer and he says the value is, lies somewhere between here and here. And that's as good as you can get and it approximates it, and so we know approximately how big the circle is and that's good enough. And Kuza says, absolutely not. Even though there's only a tiny, 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 tiny infinitesimal difference. Well, not quite infinitesimal, but there's a tiny, tiny, tiny difference. It's still the difference. And that the circle uh, is, uh, has a higher quality to it. So this gets into an idea of the... Um, um, anyway, it brings you more and more towards what I'm focusing on here, which is man's mind is a reflection of the divine mind, man, mind as governing the sense-perceptual universe. If you think about what Aristotle said, Aristotle takes mind completely out of the equation. Mind doesn't have any governing properties over the universe. The universe is just a series of, like, facts, basically. You know, Aristotle is the one who's, who, in his, like, like, you know, treatise on natural, on natural science, he, he, he thinks it's very important to include the number of hairs on a lion's head, you know. 
And that's this idea of knowledge, is, you know, you've got to know all these different specific things. So, let me continue, but people should keep on just jumping in, and we can just try to work through these ideas. Aristotle, his system has implications, which are, and actually, very explicit, right? These are two sections, they're not actually following each other immediately, from politics, from his famous work, Politics. The slave is a living possession and property, an instrument. The master is only the, mas only the master of the slave. He does not belong to him, the slave, that is. Whereas the slave is not only the slave of his master, but wholly belongs to him. For that some should rule and others be ruled is a thing not only necessary, but expedient. From the hour of their birth, some are marked out for subjugation, others for rule. You know, that's how it is. Is this for real? <laughs> yeah. Many of the Aristotle quotes I took from a... Um, an article we put out in the show in um, Fidelio, whose, article, whose author I forget, but she's, she's a European ex member. Yeah. This dominated the Catholic Church for centuries. Yeah, exactly. Just like think about a society that's completely based on this without the United States ever existing. Mm -hmm. They can justify what? Justify, justify whatever the heck you want. Well, they justify the old dark system that they operate with. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, but then, and that's the point. This is not, this is, this is not learning, this is not discovery. Aristotle is nothing like that. He's just, he's just, it's just a justification. Yeah. It's a, it's a, 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 a yeah, yeah, right. The, the, the school of the building of the cathedral in, in France and the Germany, mm -hmm. they had, he had Aristotle and the other, the other side, but they could not get rid of the, Well, how could you get rid of it if you have the oligarchy is sponsoring Aristotle, right? First, you have to wage the fight against the oligarchy. If you want to get out from underneath Aristotle, if you want to change the way that your society thinks, the way that individuals think... So, think about that again, because Kuza, what he does politically, which is what I went through in the last class, is completely essential to him being able to achieve what he does ontologically. And remember, it's on the trip back from Constantinople, which he knows is going to be massively successful, that, and Hardy has been by the very fact that he's coming back with the emperor and the, and the patriarchs and so forth. He, um, he has the vision of, from the father of light of how to understand incomprehensible truths incomprehensibly, which is the doctor. So, Aristotle continues, then, oh, th then ought the good to rule, and then, <laughs> this is really funny, then ought the good to rule and have supreme power? Should the best man rule? No. <laughs> the principle to be maintained is that the multitude ought to be supreme rather than the few best. For the many plurality of whom each individual is but an ordinary person, when they meet together may very likely be better than the few good, if regarded not individually but collectively. For some understand one part and some another, and among them they understand the whole. <laughs> Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. That's how they decided to kill Christ. <laughs> That's right. They took a vote. <laughs> That's right. That's how they elected Obama. They were Soviets. Okay. The the parade continues. All right. All in this is from 
again, <laughs> the, study, <laughs> the study of buttholes. <laughs> All instruction given or received by way of argument proceeds from pre-existing knowledge. Again, all instruction given or received by way of argument proceeds from pre-existing knowledge. The mathematical sciences and all other speculative, speculative disciplines are acquired in this way, and so are the two forms of dialectical reasoning, syllogistic and inductive. For each of these latter makes use of old knowledge to impart new. The syllogism, by assuming an audience that accepts its premises, Induction by exhibiting the universe as implicit in a wide, clearly known particular. Again, the persuasion exerted by rhetorical arguments is, the, is in principle the same, since they use either example a kind of induction or enthymeme, a form of syllogism. So, people know what syllogisms are. Here's an example. So you start with a major premise, then you have a minor premise, and that leads you to a conclusion. All A is B, all E, all C is B, all C is A. B is the middle term, and it's the cause in this system. It's the cause for that accounts for C as being A. Okay, all Greeks are mortal. Socrates is Greek, so therefore Socrates is mortal. All birds fly. Hawks are birds. Hawks fly. So in this system, you say to yourself. Why do hawks fly? Does anyone know the answer? <laughs> because they're birds, right. Why do you know they're birds? How do you know they're birds? Because they fly. Because they fly. Because they fly. <laughs> <'Cause> they fly. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. obviously, this is really just this. Obviously, the way the system works is that whoever has the force to impose the premises gets to decide what's, you know, what's true. That's like, that's just the way it is, yeah. And, um, and, it, and what he's doing is, what is he doing? Is explicitly denying, well, let me rephrase that. He cr prevents any discussion of metaphor. You know, you see, you know, like, Really think about how much Lynn has talked about metaphor in the past few years. Metaphor is the way is a way by which you can give instructions, so to speak, without pre existing knowledge, right? Because you're think about Mino's dialogue, you're awakening something that is inherent to the person. The the you you're 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 uh, you're giving them a spark that, uh, within their own soul, then they, they convert into knowledge. Or the, you know, not convert, but they, they are led unto knowledge through that sparking of their own divine spirit. So just considering that this is, this is, where, this is where we are in 1400, you know. I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot of different things going on. There's, there's, Kuzu's not the only person doing good things, of co obviously, right? But, again, what's happened is that because of this, you have this radical collapse of the population. Uh, you have a collapse. I like the point that, that Alexandra makes, which is that it's not like people weren't trying to figure things out throughout the, 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 throughout the Dark Ages and so on. It's just that they were doing so according to insane, insane laws like this. And so, what were they more interested in? You know, alchemy. And, <laughs> and uh, they couldn't figure out anything that meant anything because they were just basing their, basing their ideas on precedent. Well, Aristotle already figured out these things. Aristotle already figured out what the four elements are. So, we already know what those are. So, we can sort of innovate, but... So it's just insane. It's just like, can you imagine? This is a world where 99.9% .9 of all people are just totally, they, they live lives of beasts. Even, even if you say, well, 99.9% not, .9 of them weren't, com weren't totally, completely impoverished. Maybe 96% of them were totally impoverished. But even that other, <laughs> other percentage of people 
whatever they're doing they're just leaving living like these they're just going along you know and their children will do what they do and and so forth um, so then put yourself into the mind of someone who is desperately grasping for the future and how deeply you desire to have something truthful when you know that what you're dealing with is such it's just a bunch of lies you know and you have that sense within you because obviously every human being is born to a mother and a father and you have a relationship to your parents and you know when then when you're born you the someone uh, the mother who looks into the into the child's eyes sees in that instant that the child is in imago dei right i mean that's that's the most obvious human experience that exists that doesn't have any you can't take that away no matter what you do but you live so you so you're desperately seeking for for the future and think about what saint paul and Christ do against this. You know, compare what Aristotle says about knowledge and how you receive knowledge to 1 Corinthians 13 and what that says. That's the principle of metaphor. Right? So, so I think this does a wonderful job of capturing this. This is from a guy named St. Anselm who influenced Cusa he um, he wrote something called the Proslogion. He's you know what I should I probably I have it written down somewhere, but this is, he's from like um, I think early 1200s, maybe even 1100s. It escapes me at the moment, but you could look it up easy. But anyway, he's several hundred years before Cusa. And um, and he's a uh, he's. I don't recall all the, his biographical details, but he's you know he's a he, he's a monk, and he's a scholar, and he's desperately seeking this kind of future. Um, may may have been early 1300s. Anyway, this is a remarkable thing that he writes, that is actually a proof of God, the existence of God. So if you have any doubts, you can just turn to this and <laughs> figure it out. Um, <laughs> It is really a proof of the existence of God. You have to work through it, but I'm not going to work through that part. But what it, um, but you'll see, you'll see, anyway, let me just get into it. Chapter 1, Arousal of the Mind for contemplat Contemplating God. Come now, insignificant man. Leave behind for a time your preoccupations. Seclude yourself for a while from your disquieting thoughts. Turn aside now from heavy cares and set aside your wearisome tasks. Make time for God and rest a while in Him. Enter into the inner chamber of your mind. Shut out everything except God and what is of aid to you in seeking Him. After closing the chamber door, Seek him out. Speak now, my whole heart. Speak now to God. I seek your countenance. Your countenance, O Lord, do I seek. Countenance is your face. So come now, Lord my God. Teach my heart where and how to seek you. Where and how to find you. If you are not here, O Lord, where shall I seek you who are absent? But if you are everywhere, why do I not behold you as present? But surely you dwell in light inaccessible? Yet where is light inaccessible? Or how shall I approach unto light inaccessible? Or who will lead me to and into this light so that in it I may behold you? Furthermore, by what signs, by what facial appearance shall I seek you? Never have I seen you, 
O Lord my God. I am not acquainted with your face. What shall this your distant exile do? What shall he do, O most exalted Lord? What shall your servant do, anguished out of love for you and cast far away from your face? He pants to see you, but your face is too far removed from him. He desires to approach you, but your dwelling place is inaccessible. He desires to find you, but does not know your abode. He longs to seek you, but does not know your countenance. O Lord, you are my God and you are my Lord, yet never have I seen you. You have created me and created me anew and have bestowed upon me whatever goods I have, but I am not yet acquainted with you. Indeed, I was made for seeing you, but not yet have I done that for which I was made. So, this reminds me of um, what Lynn famously said about the people at Tiananmen Square, which is that they were, they were looking, they were seeking for their souls, they were looking for their souls. <laughs> but you get a sense of what, what are people grappling with? How do you deal with, with a truth that is completely inaccessible to you? How do you know it? How do you look for, is this question again, like how do you look for something if you don't know what it is that you're looking for? How do you look for God's face if you don't know what he looks like? And Kuza resolves this, which is completely stunning through the method of learned ignorance, through de docta ignorantia. He gives you a way to seek unto God, unto truth, unto goodness. He gives you a method to get there. So it's a stunning gift that he's given to people within this time period and people of all time. Well, doesn't Anselm get further into this in terms of just not just asking a question but actually... Anselm does remarkable things, but he doesn't do what Kuza does. In particular, what Kuza himself says he achieves is that he takes the method of the coincidence of opposites and applies it to God, which no one else has dared to do up until this point. People have challenged, of course, obviously under Aristotle's system, you can't have a coincidence of opposites. Now, do people sort of have a sense of what I mean by that? I'm going to go through it right here. Why not, why not just go ahead and we can think it through? Actually, um... In order to get to the concept of coincidence of opposites, I'm going to go through two lengthy passages from the doctor. So try to stick, you know, just stick with me on this. This is from book one, in which he's talking, book one is about, it's about God, the absolute maximum. Book two is about the universe, the created maximum. And book three is about Christ, who is the absolute maximum in the created maximum. In a sense, he's, you know, he's the man, he's God as man. Kuza says in book one, since I'm going to discuss the maximum learning of ignorance, which we kind of already went through, the, the idea that you have to have an ignorance, you have to have, be learned in your, you have to have, be learned in your ignorance, you have to know, like Socrates did, that the only thing that the only thing I know is that I don't know, right? So we're going to discuss the maximum learning of ignorance. Kuza makes this bold claim at the beginning of De Docta that this is, this is going to be the critic. These things have never been thought of before. These things have never been done before. And you're not going to be so impressed, Cardinal Cesarini, by the, so much by the substance of my uh, arguments as by the boldness of my putting them forward. Not a, it's not really a hypothesis. I mean, it is, but it's much stronger than that. He's saying, I've discovered a unique breakthrough in how to know God and how to know the truth. 
in what the mind of man is. Since I am going to discuss the maximum learning of ignorance, I must deal with the nature of maximality. Now I give the name maximum to that than which there cannot be anything greater. But fullness befits what is one. Thus, oneness, which is also being, coincides with maximality. But if such oneness is altogether free from all relation and contraction, obviously nothing is opposed to it, since it is absolute maximality. Thus, the maximum is the absolute one, which is all things. Let me pause there for a second to make sure people... You know, you, one, you would think that in your normal way of thinking, one is opposed to two. These are separate, these, these, you know, oppose each other as concepts. But the absolute one, that is then, that then which there cannot be anything greater, is such that it couldn't be opposed to anything. So you're thinking about a different kind of one, the absolute one. So just start, you know, follow. And all things are in the maximum, for it is the maximum. And since nothing is opposed to it, the minimum, likewise, coincides with it. <laughs> and hence the maximum is also in all things. So all things are in the maximum, and the maximum is in all things. Because the maximum, we're talking about again this idea of the absolute one, the one to which two is not opposed. Similarly, the, max, the absolute maximum is the maximum to which the minimum is not opposed. And this is the coincidence of opposites. You think that maximum and minimum are opposites, but in a higher conception, they are actually one. Is that like one uh, certainly it's related to the, debate, to the discussion of the one versus the many. Um, yeah, let's continue on this track, because it's not really possible to take Kuz's arguments and like, um, I don't know, let me, let me, let's just continue. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, it can be. It can't be greater, and it also can't be less than what it is, because then it wouldn't be absolute. And because it is absolute, the maximum, because it is absolute, it is actually every possible being, every not just every actual being. He says every possible being. It contracts nothing from things all of which derive from it. In the first book, I shall strive to investigate incomprehensibly above human reason <laughs> this maximum, which the faith of all nations indubitably believes to be God. I shall investigate with the guidance of him who alone dwells in an accessible light. So think about this, the, the, again, the boldness of this, of saying, we're going to go past reason. We're going to go past human reason. Where you thought human was, humanity was, you didn't even know. He uses the word contract a lot. This is all the way right here. This is the way Kuzu refuted Kant. Here's this argument right here. Later on at the end of the class, I have to mention Kuzu Bernstein. Yeah, I mean, well, yeah, and, and, and it's going to unfold massively. I mean, uh, Kuza has <coughs> remarkable uh, ide uh, ideas about cosmology in book two that are completely critical to Kepler. And actually, I just got an email today from Ben Denniston that, that um, 
um, Alexander von Humboldt, while well, he's working with Gauss, cites Cusa in his, in his cosmological observations in Book <coughs> Two of De Docta. Sure. If something is contracted, it's um, it, uh, it it's like um, when a muscle contracts, right? It it gets smaller. If you contract, if something is contracted, it is it is not absolute. It is sort of some portion thereof. Does that follow? That's a different meaning of the word. Yeah, it's not how he uses it in this. It's like parts. This is a verb. Contract is a verb. I mean, okay, and, and because it is absolute, it is absolute, actually every possible being, it contracts nothing from things, all of which derives from it, derived from it. It doesn't take anything away from things. That's what it, that, you could use that as well. So, in that, in that sense. Therefore, and this is from a slightly different portion, it doesn't follow immediately. Maximum equality is neither other than nor different from anything, which is, ni which is neither other than nor different from anything, surpasses all understanding. Because how can you understand... How could you measure with your reason one thing to another the absolute maximum? You have no measuring stick, so you can't possibly understand it. Yeah, you can't, you can't compare it to something else. Hmm. Hence, since the absolutely maximum is all that which can be, it is altogether actual. And just as there cannot be a greater, so for the same reason there cannot be a lesser, since it is all that which can be. But the minimum is that than which there cannot be a lesser. And since the maximum is also such, it is evident that the minimum coincides with the maximum. Boom. All right. The four, we already went through that. That's what, that was Mike's point. The foregoing point will become clearer to you if you contract maximum and minimum to quantity. So in other words, take away from your concept of maximum and minimum everything except for quantity. So think of maximum in terms of quantity. For maximum quantity is maximally large and minimum quantity is maximally small. Therefore, if then, if you free maximum and minimum from your concept of quantity, by mentally removing large and small, you will see clearly that maximum and minimum coincide. For maximum is a superlative just as minimum is a superlative. Therefore, it is not the case that absolute quantity is maximum quantity rather than minimum quantity, for in it the minimum and the maximum, and the minimum is the maximum coincidingly.
that it's measurable in that way. That's why it's like super, it's beyond reason, because people think of reason in terms of measurement less or more and things like that. And, well, yeah, and you can, uh, when you read this, you see also, obviously, that Kuza has a very specific idea of reason and so forth. He goes through it, and um, of the senses. He's, I, you're 100% right, I think. Therefore, let's see, did I want to include this part? Therefore, opposing features belong only to those things which can be comparatively greater or lesser. They befit these things in different ways, but they do not at all befit the absolutely maximum since it is beyond all opposition. So, I think another question is sort of like, again, to return to this question of the boldness, what do you plan to achieve? What are you going to contribute? Why are you doing science? Why are you doing whatever you're doing? What are you doing? Because there's plenty of people who are sort of sensing this in society today say, okay, kind of, there's something, you know, so what Lynn talks about, and so you wish about the creature under the door. There's something under the door, and you know it's there. But if you don't bother it, if you don't tease it, then you can always just play around outside of the closet, you know, outside of the door, right? Whereas, you have to, if you, if you want to, if you want to do anything worthwhile for humanity, you have to think about the absolute maximum. You have to, you have to seek a truth that is infinite and eternal. Right, and that's 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 <clears throat> that's the uh, that's a principle. <clears throat> it's interesting, in, in a similar way, in an earlier book, uh, in dialectical economics, Lynn says that when you apprehend this insight, you're changed forever. So you spend your life either devoted to it or running away from it, but you're changed forever. Once you have this insight. Yeah. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. What'd you caught. say? The ex member. Oh, yeah. Caught. I'm caught. I have to. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. <laughs> you caught me. <laughs> I can't go away. <laughs> um, okay, so this is somewhat different. But, um, okay, so knowing that about the coincidence of opposites, what we just went through there, Kuza is remarkable in what he does with mathematical, you know, um, images, likenesses, he refers to it as, to help you get these things. And um, I th if I understand correctly, Raymond Lull did a lot of this. So he has, he has, you know, he has people who were using things this way before him. Um, and again, this goes to his relationship with Toscanelli. But one of the critical examples is the question of um, curvature and straightness. And he says maximum curvature and minimum curvature coincide. And you can see that in this expression. You have a, you have a small circle, a slightly bigger circle, a slightly bigger circle, and you can see if you were to widen that circle more and more and more and more and more and more, eventually it would become a line. And that would be the most curved, because it would be the biggest circle. <laughs> right? He's asking you to think that way. It doesn't make sense to your rational mind because you couldn't do that on paper. <laughs> you know, you have to get in the Guinness <laughs> Book of World Records, the biggest circle or whatever. But, but um, you know, I guess eventually you would have a circle that you could then go put all around the world. <laughs> and then it would be a line, right? But um, <laughs> anyway, so... Maximum curvature and maximum uh, and minimum curvature coincide in straightness, in infinite straightness, or the infinite line, which is straight. <coughs> there's a lot to there's a lot to this. So 
consider this a very tiny teaser of, of these beautiful examples that he goes through. Because, anyway. But that's an example of the coincidence of opposites. Thinking this way allows him to make incredible breakthroughs on astronomy by entirely through thought experiments, entirely through method, and not, although he is, as we learned in the other class, a, an astronomer himself, it's not because of his, you know, um, it's not because of his observations that he comes to these conclusions, which are, in a sense, forecasts, because he's not, he, he's, he's making assertions that are then going to be proven true by Kepler, by Kepler's own discoveries, right? He says, I maintained at the outset of my remarks, this is from book two, He's talking about the nature of the universe. At the outset of my remarks, that with regard to things which are comparatively greater and lesser, we do not come to a maximum in being an impossibility. Right, so in, 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 you're talking about numbers. Um, if the numbers, you can always have one that's bigger and one that's smaller. So you're never going to get, it's like when you ask a six-year-old, like, what's the biggest number? <laughs> you know. 10,532. Uh, 10, <laughs> right. What about, yeah. <laughs> what about 10,533? <laughs> um, so we do not come to a maximum in being in possibility. Hence, in my earlier remarks, I indicated that precise equality befits only God. Wherefore, it follows that except for God, all positable things differ. Therefore, one motion cannot be equal to another, nor can one motion be the measure of another, since necessarily the measure and the thing measured differ. Although these points will be of use to you regarding an infinite number of things, nevertheless, if you transfer them to astronomy, you will recognize that the art of calculating lacks precision since it presupposes that the motion of all the other planets can be measured by reference to the motion of the sun. Even the ordering of the heavens with respect to whatever kind of place or respect to the risings and settings of the constellations or to the elevation of a pole and to things having to do with these is not precisely knowable. And since no two places agree precisely in time and setting, it is evident that judgments about the stars are, in their specificity, far from precise. If you subsequently adapt this rule to mathematics, you will see that equality is actually impossible with regard to geometrical figures, and that no thing can precisely agree with another, either in shape or in size. Does that follow? Yeah. And you can think about, too, like, what if, what if Kepler, I, I don't think this is possible, but imagine a world where Kepler doesn't make his discoveries, but there are advances in optics and there's advances in, you know, technology, such that you can make closer and closer and closer observations, more and more and more precise. Kuz's point is, you could do that forever. You would, never, you would never actually come to precision. Your concept of precision would constantly get more and more you know, closer in, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't mean anything uh, it, since you're not actually seeking cause. Right. Right. I like Jason's point on that, which yeah. is like, <laughs> yeah, remember he said, like, these people think that they have figured something ab out about what happened in the first nanosecond or first you know, whatever of, of the universe, when there's <laughs> when we don't even when we don't even know I, like what what hubris when when people we don't know they don't even know when we're gonna have fusion when, when we're gonna no, have we fusion go we don't back, have but fusion we do yeah know what happens yeah exactly right <laughs> yeah exactly there you go we don't know. right okay so allow me to continue. 
Later, using that argument, he gets to this point. If we consider the various movements of the spheres, we will see that it is not possible for the world machine to have as a fixed and immovable center either our perceptible earth or air or fire or any other thing. For with regard to motion, we do not come to an unqualifiedly minimum, that is, to a fixed center. How could you have a fixed center in a world where no motion, in the universe where no mo motion can, be, uh, can, can reach a maximum in being? Because every motion can be a little bit more, a little bit less. So how could you ever come to an absolute fixed, still center of the universe? He says you can't. Obviously it's impossible. So with regard to motion, we do not come to an unqualifiedly minimum, that is to a fixed center. For the unqualifiedly minimum must coincide with the unqualifiedly maximum. Therefore the center of the world coincides with the circumference. Hence the world does not have a fixed circumference. For if it had a fixed center, it would also have a fixed circumference. And hence it would have its own beginning and end within itself. And it would be bounded in relation to something else. And beyond the world there would be something both there would be both something else and space. But all these consequences are false. Therefore, since it is not possible for the world to be enclosed between a physical center and a physical circumference, the world of which God is the center and the circumference is not understood. And although the world is not infinite, it cannot be conceived as finite because it lacks boundaries within which it is enclosed. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, if you have a fixed center, then there's an unqualifiedly minimum present. And if that's the case, then there must be a maximum and qualifiedly maximum that coincides. Because any un cause if they're unqualifiedly man man minimum or maximum, then they would be the same. Right. Since we don't have that, therefore there is no... Yeah. I think it's also more... In yeah, it's more intuitive also just to think, well, if you have something that's... in. If, if you have some kind of, just imagine it, if you have a fixed middle point, then there's got to be something fixed that's moving around it, relative to that, you know. I think, I think this gets back to the Robert's question about contracting. Mm -hmm. that, that in the contracted universe, you can't. But in, in God, in the universe of gods, yeah. you have a center, and it is the circumference, because both are infinite. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a good point. And let me, let me make this, even though this seems very simple philosophy, as simple as this is, this is the proof that Nicholas Copernicus in 1514, when he wrote down his first letter to circulate among friends in Padua, that he was a new discoverer, that the sun is the center of our planetary system. And the first lie he says is the first thing. The first thing I found the center of the universe is the sun. So looking at the argument you just yeah. reviewed, there yeah. is no center of the universe. Yeah. Cusa was before Nicholas Copernicus. Yeah, and he was in the circles of the University of Padua. Yeah. That's Straight interesting. Lying up front, and then he gives you a laundry list of what he found. It doesn't matter what he found. He's lying to your face right there. Well, that's really interesting because he gets it within instead of the beginning, which is that it wasn't a mistake. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's found by the Yeah. Toronto comes to read it. Yeah, absolutely. It wasn't that he didn't know. He chose to lie. So, um, I think that these two things go together. What is that? This is Durer. This is Durer. This is the earliest self-portrait that still exists. 
In other words, in the artist's life. He's 13 years old. <laughs> he gets the blue. He gets the blue ribbon. Yeah. But um, anyway, Dura grows up in uh, Nuremberg, not far at all from, you know, not really far from Kuz. From Kuz. He's like he's like two generations later. So, I mean, okay, go back and forth. Here's, um, here, I think he's 28. I think he's 26, 27, 28, somewhere in there. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. talking about hubristic. No, 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 no. No, it's not hubristic. Well, there's two meanings of hubristic, no. but yeah. Okay, we're going to get into it. Yeah. So, here, here is also from book two. But I'm just sort of consider these two images because I think it's a similar kind of idea here. In creating the world, God used arithmetic, geometry, music, and likewise astronomy. We ourselves also use these arts when we investigate the comparative relationships of objects, of elements, and of motions. For, though arithmet for through arithmetic, God united things. Through geometry, he shaped them in order that they would thereby attain firmness, stability, and mobility in accordance with their conditions. Through music, you proportion things in such way that there is not more earth in earth than water in water, air in air, and fire in fire, and so that no one element is altogether reducible to another. As a result, it happens that the world machine cannot perish. Mm -hmm. Although part of one element can be reduced to another, it is not the case that all the air which is mixed with water can ever be transformed into water, for the surrounding air would prevent this. Thus there is ever a mingling of the elements. So I find this to be a somewhat difficult passage to parse, but he goes on, I didn't include the whole thing, but he goes on to <coughs> talk about the nature of harmony. And I think a simple way to conceive of this passage is that because God built the universe around the principles of harmony, therefore it will never wind down and dissipate. What's that? Yeah, well, yeah, it would, yeah, it would be disharmonic. I mean, it's uh, the this is. This is why I'm saying this, these, these two images go together because they're ones of generation, right, of development. Because he's, this is Uzo saying, he says, as he says otherwise in, in De Docta, that, that evolution, the evolution of things progresses to a higher and higher level. The world is never going to wind down, don't worry about it. This isn't a clockwork universe. We live in a universe that's harmonic, and therefore it always persists. And this is also kind of a dialogue with the Timaeus of Plato. Right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And also the conservation of matter. Yeah, I was going to say that. Yeah, entropy. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Now, I don't know what Aristotle has to say about it, but I'm sure he said some bad, stupid things. <laughs> he says, I want to kill Kuza. <laughs> <laughs> Mm -hmm. It plays around with the, the relationship of the radius of the circle to the different polygons and the different degrees of mobility. Because there is um, <coughs> there's the degree where one line uh, is a portion of a larger line, for example, which is a certain comparative relation. But these are these are objects of the line. They're not. Mm-hmm. So that brings us to book three, which is about man's mind. It's about Christ, 
and it's about Christ as the as the apex of humanity, as the apex of creation. Apex, yeah, absolutely. As the apex of creation, as the um, as God in man, and I have some good quotes. Uh, hold on. Let me start here. Such testimonies, together with more <coughs> elsewhere, are exhibited by the saints regarding the fact that he is God and man. In him, the humanity was united to the word of God, so that the humanity existed not in itself, but in the word. For the humanity could not have existed in the supreme degree and in complete fullness other than in the divine person of the Son. This is not explicitly about Christ, but I think it gives you a context for what he's talking about. This is from book two. See to it, says our learned ignorance, that you discover yourself in him. Since in him all things are him, it will not be possible that you lack anything. Yet, our approaching him, who is inaccessible, is not our prerogative. Rather, it is the prerogative of him who gave us both a face which is turned toward him and a consuming desire to seek him. When we do seek him, he is most gracious and will not abandon us. Instead, having disclosed himself to us, he will satisfy us eternally when his glory shall appear. May he be blessed forever. So. He's talking about God at this point. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's very much... Some people have said, although it's not factually true, that Kuza's work is the theology of... or the, or I, I, guess the sci, I guess yeah, the science of, the camp, of Kempis's theology. So, um, I think it would be worth doing like a whole class on book three. <coughs> Excuse me. But um, I think if you want to get it, for the moment, I think we can do this through metaphor. Because people are probably aware that this is a portrait of Durer as Christ. That this is a pose that is reserved for Christ. Even portraits of, 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 and you can think about the pose too, that he's looking straight out at you. This is a portrait which would follow because of its perspective and because of the way that the face is pointed straight out of the canvas. It would follow the, it, it'll follow you wherever you go, which is very important to Kuza in his piece, The Vision of, of God, on the vision of God. And so there's a way that Durer's spirit is always with you if you're in the room with this thing. And, is, and if I'm, it's always with me if I'm walking this way, but it's also always with you if you're walking this way. So, well, we, we saw a sculpture which uh, I think it was in Louvre, mm -hmm. uh, where uh, God is in, um, with the apostle and he's in the middle and he's down. But when you look at the sculpture, he's looking to you. Mm -hmm. You can move everywhere. He's just to you. That's fascinating. I didn't know you could do it with a sculpture. With a sculpture. Is the sculpture up? I do. Yeah, but it's not, uh, it's, I, be, I believe it's not a sculpture of somebody known, it's an unknown sculpture. Well, it's a middle-aged uh, guy. Yeah. Uh, the other thing about that is the hands. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, this is the idea of self-creation, mm -hmm. that he is making himself, 
and in the imitation of Christ, as Thomas Akempis. Yeah. And that, it, you know, it, it struck me in hearing Mr. Salinas and uh, uh, what is it, the, uh, what the, 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 the uh, oh, Lamb of God, uh, on your stage, mm-hmm. they told us to come to him, that, 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 that the way he, Beethoven does it is like a battle, it's like a fight. That you that Christ is active in the universe still through you because you're living in the imitation. Yeah, yeah. That you can attain unto the Word, which is to say that, I mean, think of it from a, another way of thinking about it. Human creativity in God is God's creativity. So. A few people had mentioned to me that other artists did this, but I didn't know of any off the top of my head, so I looked it up a little bit. And um, here's Titian. Who's that? Titian. He's a Venetian painter. Who's that on the left? Oh, it's supposed to be Christ. Oh, that's supposed to be Christ? Okay. On the left, but it's also clearly Titian. Mm-hmm. Oh, and he does it again. Same, that's the same artist? Yeah. yeah. And you can see it's kind of the same thing as the Durer, because the Durer has... One of the other provocative things about it is the way that the uh, he signs it. Because his initials, Albertus, you know, Albert Durer, or A.D., so on the left it's 1500 A.D. <laughs> um, but it's right next to the, you know, right, right next to the eyes. It names him. And here Titian signs right next to his self-portrait as Christ. And he, Rembrandt did this on the left, which when you look at close up, it, on the right is a self-portrait. I think it's also pretty convincing. It looks like Rembrandt to me. So, in a sense, like, part of the point is that is what, what you're tending towards, I think, in terms of, like, wow, that is, that's incredibly bold. And that's what Kuza did. Kuza did something incredibly bold. He said, Hey, now I figured out how we can figure out God. <laughs> and, uh, and we know why he did it from the context, the strategic context, from, the, um, from you know, what, what, what kind of person he was. What was he trying to achieve for mankind? But does, I mean, he uses this formulation, I think, about we are each little gods or something yeah. like that. I mean, that is incredibly... Yeah. The first time I heard that, I almost... He says we can become the adopted children of God, among other formulations. He uses a lot of different things. But um, it's not the I am a worm school of Christianity, you know? What? Yes, total. What was that song Lynn always used to hate? Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace, yeah. A wretch like me. Used to hate. A wretch like me, yeah. This is definitely not that school. I mean, like he's, it's Plato. As we do unto others, that's actually me. And we should live for This is actually true. Yeah. What was the picture on the right of those two? This is a woodcut. There's not many. There's only two existing self-portraits of Titian, and they're both when he's 70. Oh, I see. So this is a woodcut of one that's been lost that's from earlier in his life. Um, so, with that, let me just go back to, if you were having trouble seeing these people as Christ, then just go back to what Lynn said. 
You must see ourselves as individuals, as potentially the embodiments of reason, as Imago Dei. We must look into the faces of people around the world and see not different races or this or that distinction, but see in those faces, in those eyes, another human being who is also Imago Dei. So I think it also brings, I mean, Helga is really clear. The coincidence of opposites is the most important thing we can be thinking about politically. She said that more than once. Um, and I admit I find that to be a really challenging thing to work through. In a sense, when one thing, one aspect of what she's talking about is that you have to find, you find the level, you raise, you raise and raise and raise the level of dialogue as 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 Kuza does with on the piece of faith, where he says, "I had a vision of a, of a dialogue that happened in heaven, and Saint Peter was there and." Christ was there and the Lord was there and representatives of 17 nations were there having a conference in heaven. And on that plane, the opposites coincide. And what's best for you is best for me. And what's worst for you is worst for me, you know. And, and uh, anyway, that's, that's clearly, you know, this is the same idea that Xi, Jing, Xi Jinping is representing the in the uh, in, in this in the, the the tide that lifts all boats, it is very much the same train of thought. The principle of, the principle of Westphalia. That's you know I'll, I'll have to do a class on the Catholic Concordance as well. But this anyway, this is what I thought. This is the best I could do at, at bringing bringing to bear this particular principle from out of Cusa that Lynn that Lynn establishes is most important. Um, so I hope it is again, I hope that people get excited to read this whole thing. So that's what I got. Any other questions or comments? Well, it just doesn't function. If you have and then they just pursue that by making, you know, by, with agents, with force. How could you have, think about this. There's a slave and a master. And Lincoln says, neither slave nor master. If you're not one, you have to be the other. Right? And the, yeah, right. <laughs> and then in, in a syllogistic thinking, a, a syllogism can't, function if if all B is A and also all B is not A. You can't it doesn't work. It requires that you reduce everything. That you take you have to cut the mind out of out of the universe before you can do anything with, with logic. I mean logic, the whole point of logic is that and any logician will tell you the beautiful thing about logic is that it doesn't have any meaning to it. <laughs> I mean, that's like seriously what they'll say. Is that you don't have to know meaning. Is all. It's objective, exactly. Value yeah, value free, free. right. That reminds me of a joke. Otherwise, worthless. Huh? Otherwise, worthless. Yeah, right. Value free. So how can you... So you can't, you can't think this way. In, a, in, in the vision of truth, in, excuse me, on the vision of God, which what I was mixing up with is Helga's very beautiful piece on it called On the Sweetness of Truth. Kuza talks about the coincidence of opposites as being the barrier to the garden of, of highest delights. I forget exactly what phrase he uses, but to the garden of, you know, to truth, to, to finding, to meeting to meaning truth, to, to finding the face of God, first, excuse me, you have to get over the wall, which is the coincidence of opposites. So the coincidence of opposites is not the truth. It's a pathway to getting to the truth. And if you don't pass through it, then you're not going to the truth, you're going somewhere else. But it gives you, yeah, grants you that method. So, I mean, Without this kind of thinking and discussion with Kuza, how could, how could you know, four out of the five major religious figures from
from the Greek delegation at the Council of, Con Council of Florence actually agree with him about the Filioque if they didn't understand this. They, they, they had to, um, you know, they had to, you think, think about the confidence they had to take from his thinking, from his discoveries, to be able to say, all of our church fathers were wrong going back 800 years. And yet, I'm going to be right. I'm not going to screw tradition. You know, screw, screw that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with the truth. Yeah, I hadn't thought about it that way when you, when you went to this in the last class. I just think it, had to think of these things in religious terms or something. But uh, clearly, that's what he would have to do with John and these people. And they say, oh my God, so all this crap we've been, up, we've been putting up with, the conflict between these two churches, this is all part of a, a completely fraudulent system. In some way, they were, had to be recruited the way that Lynn would recruit leaders into a, a much higher conception of who they are and then their role in history. So that's then, pretty amazing. Then, then they have to confront the thought, my God, how am I going to play this at home? Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, that's yeah. why they yeah, got to go to the conference. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Maybe, Maybe I should reconsider. The guy who went back to Russia, Isidore. Isidore, he got, they, within days of arriving, they, they ran him out. He, and then he managed to escape. And then he got to... Uh, he got to Constantinople, and he was there for the sack of Constantinople, and he got, he got enslaved. He got captured and imprisoned and enslaved. Um, but he managed to avoid being killed because he hid in a... Uh, he pretended he was dead. He hid in someone's, someone's clothes, pretending he was dead. And then finally, and somehow he escaped from slavery. And, um, but yeah, he got... Immediately upon returning, when the when the Muscovites realized, right, when the when the people in when the church in Moscow realized what he had done, they said, "This is outrageous," you know, jail him. That was the third Rome, right? Yeah, right, right. No, that would have been in the in the mid 1440s. 1453 is the attack on Constantinople. It's the fall of Constantinople. Anyway, I think that the other thing is that this, the, you know, if you're thinking, if you're thinking like this, then you can't think tactically. It precludes such a way of thinking. And and it gets you, and, and it just, again, it gets you, what is the reductionism that's been imposed since 1900? It's been to destroy this. Why, why isn't Kuza universally known for his great breakthroughs? Because he was intentionally destroyed. Not destroyed, but intentionally occluded. And therefore, what is it that people need to become cognizant of if they're going to really do what's necessary today, it's this, it's these ideas, it's this right here. It, rem uh, it reminds you of the, um, the one section of the mountaintop speech where he's, he has God flying him over all of history and he passes by a bunch of the history and he says, stop me there because that's where I could, it's one of the worst crises and that's where I could do the most good. That is, it, it's also a battle. <coughs> When you run up, when you see the worst thing going on, the only way to solve it, as you said, is to do the most good. Yeah. It's, a, it's a real physical principle. So I think that thinking about it from that kind of perspective, and think, then you go, but then when you're reading Kuzu, you realize that even though he never talks about Satan, in the entire book he never talks about Satan, he's always thinking about Satan. He's constantly aware of how he's going to destroy Satan. So. This is off topic a little bit. Okay. But because I, I was reading uh, Othello yesterday. Yeah. And th the thing that really strikes you because this total bastard Iago is just lying to everybody, and he succeeds in turning everybody against each other and destroying everything. And it, you see that this question of naivete of evil 
is not a good thing. <laughs> that naivete is not a positive quality. And it's interesting. How, that's what I was thinking of when it says, yeah. when, when Lynn says, we have to let not merely deny it, we must denounce it. Let us be prompted by evil. The tragedy of evil must be attacked, recognized, yeah. feared, and hated to such a degree we're willing to do good to supplant it. Anyway. Yeah, you know, in the because in the play, everyone thinks that the Turks are the evil ones. Exactly. And they say, oh, I turned Turk, you turned Turk. Have we all turned Turks, you know? I slew a Turk, right? And really it's... And they always say, everyone calls him Honest Iago, like yeah, his first Iago, name. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's still really evil. Did you answer John? John? Uh-huh. Is that right? Uh-huh. Like Diego? Yeah. yeah. Anyway, the, uh, yeah, that's good. That's good. Yeah, you know, I, I, I think about it, if we actually execute on that principle, right? if we actually deploy on that principle. Like one of the things that I talked about with a f few people is um, uh, I think we have to do national recruitment. I think we have to deploy for a recruitment drive from a national standpoint. I don't see how we could do it otherwise. And if you were to think in such a way, then we would do something like we would go into Brooklyn and we would expose the people who's controlling your minds. You know, then there's, you know, who's, who, because who runs the particular campaigns that establish environmentalism and cultural degeneracy as the primary, you know, as the primary intellectual concepts in the youth culture today, in the, pe in the people under the age of 25. There are specific people who do it. There are sat Satanists who, who run that operation. And people just have no idea because they lack, because they're stuck in Aristotelian thinking and they're not, they don't believe in their own minds.